Hey, recording is on. Try once again. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting to this course, um, BC310 on church and ministry administration. We are going to get started uh, on this course today. It's our first week this semester, fall 2022. And um, yeah, so I'm actually doing this course from home. And uh, uh, so for the other course, I would uh, be in the college. All right, um, anyone wants to pray? Would like to just lead us in prayer and then we'll get started. Pastor, can I say? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful morning which you have given to us. Lord, we surrender and dedicate our life before you at this Father. Please prepare us, oh Father God, so that we can be used by you, Lord Master. Whatever we are going to listen and receive, oh Father, let it be useful for Lord Master our spiritual edification and also let it edify our spirit man, let it increase our knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, O oh Father God. We humble ourselves before your presence, and we come to a place of, uh, Lord, not a place, attitude of receiving, and we pray that, Father, fill each one of us, Lord, not to this, if with our master, with your wisdom and understanding, and so that like, we, can, we can utilize these things, whatever we are going to learn today. We cover everything under your precious blood, O oh God. Cover your servant, O oh Father God, Bless him, that Father, so that whatever he's going to speak, let it be from the throne room of God. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' most holy and majesty, name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, um, Sheikh Kumar. All right. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. And um, um, uh, we will uh, get started. Now, I have... Um, shared the um, um, two PDFs in the um, Google Classroom. Uh, one is the overview of the course, which we'll just go through. So you'll get an idea of what we're going to cover in this course, and then lesson one. Uh, what we will be doing in this course is as we go along, I'll keep sharing um, the PDF for each uh, lesson. Uh, I'm not putting the whole content out because uh, I try to keep updating the content uh, as we go along based on interactions and questions and so on. So um, I, I, I like to keep it a little bit fluid so that I adapt it uh, uh, to the, uh, you know, to what is happening uh, in the class. Um, so I'll keep sharing the lesson um, notes as we keep going. Okay, so, um, yeah, just one note, uh, Mangi, Mangi's in class. Mangi's, oh yeah, Mangi, I, I just realized that um, I got your email, but I did not reply to your email. So I will uh, remember to do that today. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, it's been a long time. Uh, I'll uh, write back to you about uh, an answer to your question. All right. Okay, so let's uh, get started. I'm going to share the PDF of uh, what we're going to be uh, covering. All right, let's go here. Okay, so course 310, Church and Ministry Administration. I think all of you have downloaded the PDF. Now, why are we doing a course like this, right? Church and ministry administration. Um, the fact is that although we, the ministry we are doing is a spiritual ministry, which is the ministry of the word and the spirit, that whatever work we are doing needs to be backed up with a good organization and administration so that 
when we combine the two, that means we combine the spiritual ministry we are doing, which is the ministry of the word and the spirit to serve people. When we combine that with good organization, good administration, then we can be very impactful for the kingdom of God and we can also serve many people. But what we have observed is, and, and many of you may have also observed, is that sometimes just because of a lack of good administration and management, uh, the ministry, which is very good, the spiritual side, and, you know, somebody may be very good in the ministry, the word and the anointing and so on. If they don't have good uh, organizational backing, you know, support of administration and organization, then the reach is uh, not as great. It is not that, you know, um, uh, the, the gifting is not there. It is there, but they're not able to serve people well. And also what we have seen is that sometimes if the administration, organization of the ministry breaks or falls apart, it could impact the whole ministry. And uh, there are many examples of those kinds of things. You know, we will talk about some of these as we go along. You know, uh, just one, ex one, one, one example that comes to my mind at this point uh, was that of a powerful prayer ministry. And this was in the United States. Uh, in the 1980s uh, and early 1990, 1990s, uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, there was um, uh, uh, this man of God. Um, uh, I'll just mention his name, but uh, just for you to know that I'm not making up a story. Uh, but this man, of, his name is Larry Lee. Uh, he, uh, uh, he uh, I think he graduated from Oral Roberts University. He was even... Uh, I think the dean of our Roberts University at some point, and then he went out and he started uh, a, a path of a church called Church on the Rock uh, um, in Rockwell, Texas. And uh, God had, and he was a powerful a man of prayer. So he had written, you know, I think at least two books on prayer. One was, uh, "Could you not tarry one hour?" And that book, "Could you not tarry one hour?" at that time in the late eighties, nineties. Uh, you know, became like a very popular book on prayer. Could you not tarry one hour? Just challenging, you know, the church to pray at least an hour a day. Uh, and I think he had another book also on prayer. And, uh, you know, God just anointed his ministry. And uh, at one point, uh, Larry Lee, uh, throughout the United States, um, they would pack stadiums full of people just to pray. It was amazing. You know, uh, it was not like a crusade uh, or not like a concert or worship or music, but it was stadiums packed with people who came to pray for that city. So it's like a prayer, if you want to call it a prayer concert or a prayer movement. Really, it was a prayer movement. And this was happening, you know, uh, across many cities in the U.S. So it was just a wonderful move of God and so on. And he had his church base, the church, the local church uh, in Rockwell, Texas. Now, and the church was growing, you know, hundreds, thousands of people were coming. So very, the ministry was just wonderful going. But then uh, I remember just one thing, you know, um, the offerings that were being collected, um, uh, you know, in the church, uh, or in, in the ministry, because it was money was not only coming from the congregants, it was also coming from people who would send money. Um, they found envelopes that were, you know, that were just thrown out. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but they were just discarded. And the media, uh, some TV channel reported this thing, you know, look, people are sending money, but these envelopes are thrown out. Uh, it's not being handled properly, and so on. I just, you know, and and then many, you know, TV stations uh, reported that. And but that one incident triggered the collapse of. Uh, it just became, a, a, you know, a, a, a trigger that just brought down the whole ministry, right? So. 
you know, it wasn't Larry Lee as a man, it wasn't his fault. He was doing the ministry, but the administration, the organization, the people, other people were responsible for a lot of things. I mean, it's a big, very big ministry, so a lot of things were happening. So whoever was in charge of managing, you know, the offering that were being sent, the envelopes that were put, being put in the office, somewhere people were not doing their work properly. And, uh, uh, but, you know, that was publicized, that was brought in, you know, uh, exposed or it was brought into light and it just brought collapse of the whole ministry. And it was, it was very, very sad because the man was such a wonderful man, Larry Lee, doing such wonderful ministry and something went wrong in the administration, in the organization of the ministry that just brought everything down. Yeah. And of course, when something like that happens, everybody points their finger at the man, you know, the, the person who's leading. Uh, and so uh, I'm just giving an example here. So um, we must recognize the importance of uh, organization and administration, and especially when it comes to the church or Christian ministry, because people are willingly uh, contributing their uh, offering, the tithes and offering, the offerings, their money. They're willingly giving. People are serving as volunteers. Many volunteers serve. So they're willingly giving their time and their uh, um, efforts in the ministry. And so we have to be all the more very careful uh, when it comes to organization and administration. So what we're going to do in this course is, um, uh, you know, just talk about the practical side of ministry. Uh, I'm going to share with you things that uh, we have, we are doing at APC in Bangalore, uh, uh, how we started, the journey we made, and how you know the organization grew and what was happening behind the scenes. You don't see a lot of this, but you know, we talk about a lot, a lot of that, and uh, uh, and then you know, get into the details. So basically, talk about the importance of good administration, what are the objectives, how do you form a legal entity, the trust and the governance, uh, how, what kind of organizational structure, uh, what are policies, guidelines, and standards you need to have, uh, systems and processes within the organization, how do you manage people, how do you create a good workplace culture, uh, how do you manage the money, taking care of the legal side, how do you plan and coordinate, you know, whatever you're doing, various, from the church service to various other ministries, and how do you form ministry teams, volunteer teams, uh, and then overall church culture, uh, executing projects, how you can leverage technology and overall pursue excellence uh, in what you're doing. Uh, now this aspect of technology, uh, next semester, We'll have a course on uh, uh, media and technology where we'll get into the details. Uh, so th uh, this leveraging technology kind of be a little overview of you know how you can use technology. But next semester we'll get into uh, greater depth as we talk about media and technology uh, that you can use uh, in ministry. Right. The assessment and course uh, grading is as usual uh, as we've done in the past. And I will, you know, there are a lot of good books on um, on the subject of administration. I'm just trying to see uh, one book that I can give you. Uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, I'll shortlist one and share that with you in, in the classroom, and uh, you can kind of read that if you want to read it. Is uh, the House of God, which I think you've already gone through in your second year, and that's also a um, useful book. It doesn't have everything, but it has some things that will be of use. Okay. So we're going to get into lesson number one, uh, the importance of good uh, administration. Uh, any questions from anybody on about the course, what we will be doing, uh, any thoughts here? Any questions? All right. Now, you know, it's very interesting how people think about church how people think about ministry, um, just, you know, uh, as recent as uh, 
uh, this week, uh, I received an email from somebody uh, who was completely opposed to the idea of the church being an organization. You know, uh, because right now we, we were doing a sermon series on leadership. And in one of the Sunday sermons, I mentioned, I think it was uh, part two in the series on leadership. Uh, I, I, we were talking about competence, and I mentioned, you know, the church is, uh, is a spiritual body, but it's also a, a, an organization, you know, that we have to be organized and so on. And I made some comments on the church, you know, having, being like a corporate, an organization. And so this person was upset, and so he sent me an email saying, uh, you know, he disagrees. Uh, uh, he does not uh, agree with the idea that church should be organized or be like a corporate, and like a body and so on. So, uh, you know, of course, I, I don't respond to those emails. But the point is, uh, there are people who don't like that idea that uh, while the church is a spiritual body, it is also a physical body, uh, a physical body, you know, this physical body is organized. That means th this physical body has certain parts that are in a certain place and they perform a certain function. So it is very organized. You know, um, uh, this physical body is not just, a, you know, this is a physical body. You know, uh, it, it has to be treated in a physical way, taken care of in a very physical way. So uh, the same thing with the physical side of the church. It is an organization. It, uh, you know, it has to be addressed and looked at as an organization, and it has to function well as an organization. And uh, you know, feel free to share your thoughts uh, as we go along. I know you may agree, you may disagree. That's okay. But we can, you know, we can discuss and and see, uh, you know, how best to explain explain it. Let's let's get into uh, lesson one. Any questions? Uh, any comments? Everyone's okay. All right. So let's get into our first lesson uh, on uh, the importance of uh, good administration. Now, uh, a lot of what uh, I'm going to be sharing will come from a local church perspective right, as we go further. But everything we say applies even to just uh, to a Christian organization. That means uh, if the ministry you're doing is not necessarily a local church, maybe it is a youth ministry, maybe it's a music ministry, maybe it's a, uh, you know, a, a ministry to women or it's a leadership ministry, whatever, a, a different kind of a Christian organization. Everything we say applies to that as well. So even though I'm going to be speaking a lot from a local church administration organization perspective, uh, you can apply it to any kind of Christian ministry and uh, the administration organization of any kind of Christian ministry. So let's get started now. Why is good administration very important? Right? Why is it important? Now, when you look at it from a, so we look at it from a biblical perspective and also from a simple practical perspective, and then we'll answer, we'll address some common objections that we hear, you know, from church people, like I mentioned, even other Christian leaders, uh, preachers and so on, who don't like mm, the church being considered an, an organization. From a biblical perspective, you see that uh, God is a God of order, design, organization, and creativity. So when you look at God, he, he, he's not God of, you know, disorder, but in all his works, right from, you know, you look at the single cell to this great big universe, there is order, you know. Um, things are organized. It's not haphazard. It's not unpredictable. While there is great creativity, yeah, there is always freshness and newness. Yet there is order, there is design, there is organization. So God does both. So order, design, and organization does not have to be boring. It does not have to be dull and dry. It can 
actually flow together with newness, freshness, and creativity. Right? So we see that in, in, in the way God has created everything. Right? Uh, in the midst of order, design, organization, there is freshness. There is, you know, we still stand in awe and amaze that, you know, wow, you know, uh, the things around us. And so God brings both together in the way he works. So how much more should we think about his body, the church, or his work, which is the ministry, the church and the ministry, like this, that there, will, there has to be order, design, organization in the church, in the ministry, and yet there is freshness, there is creativity, there is inspiration uh, that comes uh, from the Holy Spirit, and it just flows together. Uh, in what God does. And uh, another example we'll see, we, we are all familiar with, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Quote this verse, uh, but um, uh, it'd be nice just to turn there and read it. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Anyone? Okay, I'll, I'll read. Please go ahead. Uh, he said, For God is not God of confusion, but of peace. Yeah. So God uh, is not the author of confusion. And later on in verse 40, you know, Paul sums up this chapter in, in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 14 40. He says, Let all things be done decently and in order. So God is not the author of confusion. That is uh, something that's uh, disorderly, chaotic, and uh, but everything is done decently and in order. So even in the context of the local church and how the church operates and functions, there shouldn't be confusion. It should be decent. It should be in order. Now, we can look at many other examples in the Bible. You know, if you look into the Old Testament, uh, when you think about Moses, as a leader. Now Moses had a huge task. Now he was doing ministry, if you want to call it that. Right? Uh, he was doing ministry. What was his ministry? His ministry was, I have to lead these people from where they are in Egypt into the land of promise. That's the ministry God had given Moses. Now, of course, along the way, uh, God used him to you know, bring the Ten Commandments and establish a covenant and you know bring so much of the revelation which we call the old testament through moses but he, so that was the spiritual side of his ministry but he also had a very practical side of his ministry which is physically practically he has to lead a nation of people from egypt to canaan moses was a spiritual leader but he also had a very practical journey uh, with the people. And as you look at that journey, how they went through, Moses faced lots of problems uh, with the people, which is also today, which today is also something we will all face. Uh, we will face challenges with the people, right? So how did Moses handle it? You see in uh, Exodus, the 18th chapter, and uh, again, I'm just going to mention these. You, you can, you know, read that chapter. Uh, Moses is sitting from morning till evening to solve the problems that people are having. So he's a spiritual leader. He, you know, he's having a great encounter with God, and you know, God is giving him the commandments, and God is giving him the law, and uh, you know, God is appearing to him face to face, and uh, there is the uh, pillar of cloud, and there's a pillar of fire, there's a cloud and a fire, and just amazing miracles. But he also has to deal with all the practical issues of the people. And it's not easy, because so many people and there's so many problems. So he's sitting from morning till evening, counseling people, solving problems, 
etc. And Jethro, Moses' father, you know, he sees what Moses is doing. He says, Moses, you know, if you, if you do this, you will kill yourself. I mean, you will die. You can't handle this. So what must you do? You organize. You organize. You arrange leaders from among the people who will be responsible for groups of people, the so groups of 50, 100, etc. You organize them and let the people take their problem to that leader that you have appointed. If the leaders, you know, the leaders who you appointed, if they can't solve the problem, only those problems let it come to you. So Jethro gives Moses this wonderful advice, and Moses actually organizes it. You know, so he appoints leaders. He puts people in groups. He appoints leaders, and then says, "Look, from now on, if you have a problem, you take it to your leader, uh, and the leader should be able to help. But if the leader doesn't." Then it comes to Moses when Moses steps in, right? And then in Numbers chapter 11, so that was going on at one point. And then you come to Numbers chapter 11, where uh, still Moses feels overwhelmed by the ministry, right? So he, uh, the people are uh, asking for meat and for water and for food, and all the problems, practical problems. He's doing spiritual ministry, but there is a practical side to the whole journey. And people are coming to him saying, you know, we need this food, we need this water, we need meat, we need, you know, all this. And Moses goes to God in Numbers chapter 11. He says, God, I cannot handle this. I cannot handle this. I can't do this. How? Oh, and now God gives him a solution. And very interesting, the solution again is organizing. He says, you pick 70 leaders. That's a big number, yeah? pick out 70 leaders. And I will anoint these leaders and they are going to help you govern. They are going to help you lead the people. So what I want to point out here, numbers from Numbers 11 is, God brought about this idea of being organized. God anointed these people, these 70 leaders, who were going to help Moses practically in the ministry to take care of the people. So God is not against organizing. Right? God is not against administering. So what is administration? Administration is this physical organizing of people and resources in order to administer whatever we are going to administer to the people, the care, the counseling, and the, the word of God, so on. So God told Moses, you organize like this. And so Moses did that and they continued on in their journey. So that's just you know one example where you can see in the Bible that there is spiritual ministry, but there is a practical side. And for the practical side, it, le it needed organizing. It needed that administration part in order for the people to not only receive spiritual ministry, but to make their journey to what God wanted them. In, in, that, in, in, in that same connection, um, in Numbers chapter 10, you see God, how detailed he is in, in, in the book of Numbers, and how he wanted the people to be organized. If you read those first 10 chapters of Numbers, what, you, what we will see is God organized the 12 tribes, three tribes on each side of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was in the middle. In the front side or the north side, there were three tribes. They had to put their camp there, their tents there. South side, behind the tabernacle, three tribes and like that on the east side and on the west side. On each side of the tab tabernacle, three tribes. That's where they had to pitch their tents. So people couldn't just go and, you know, put a tent anywhere they wanted. No, this was God giving instructions. This is how you must organize every tribe. People had to, you know, put their tent 
according to the tribes. Then God said, in order to move, you have to move in uh, camp, uh, tribe by tribe. And uh, the leader would blow the trumpet. And when the trumpet is blown, then the tribe begins to move. Now just think about this. This is organization. This is administration. Way back in the book of Numbers. So God is doing something on the earth, a spiritual work, where he is uh, taking his people into their land of promise. He's fulfilling his promise to Abraham. He's giving the covenant through Moses. So he's doing a spiritual work. But along with that, there is detailed administration, organization happening in the practical day-to-day -day lives of the people as they are making their journey into the land of promise. Just one more, uh, it's a few more, not one more, but a few more. Uh, when you look at the worship in the tabernacle, right, when um, both during the time of Moses and later on during the time of David, the worship in the tabernacle was not haphazard. Everything was very organized. In the tabernacle, they were priests and the Levites. That means there was, you know, two kinds of people two sets of people, and each were given their particular task. So, you know, when we when we think about it today, we talk about roles and functions. You know, we'll talk about putting the right people to do the right things. That happened right there back in the, you know, the book of Exodus. And God told Moses, you build a tabernacle. There'll be priests who will do, handle all the sacrifices, all of that. And there'll be Levites. These people will take care of the physical work that needed to be done in the tabernacle. When you come into David's time, as David, as all of this progresses, David sets up, you know, the tabernacle. And in in First Chronicles twenty five, you find even more uh, administration and organization. What David uh, determines or decides to do is to have continuous prayer and worship, and so. He arranges fingers uh, in groups of, uh, you know, one hour slots each. And they have groups of singers who come in. They take their turns constantly. So you see, he wanted 24 hours prayer and worship to, to go from the tabernacle, but he organized it so well. And if you read that, First Chronicles 25, they were very skilled musicians and singers and worshippers but everybody was organized into one hour slot. So they would come, you can imagine, yeah, they would all show up, do their one hour, the next group comes, they do their one hour, next group comes, another hour, next group comes, another hour. And so there was continuous worship in the tabernacle. There were hundreds of priests and uh, Levites. So uh, I think the total count uh, of uh, people who are serving the tabernacle came to almost uh, 8,000 people. So he engaged so many people in order to make sure there was continuous prayer and worship in the tabernacle. And it went on nonstop for 33 years. I mean, that's, that's amazing, the kind of organization that was in play. Okay? Uh, when you think about Nehemiah having to rebuild the walls, here also it's just amazing. If you look at how he organized, And uh, even the uh, the uh, the wealthy merchants, they all participated. He put them in groups all around the wall, uh, city walls. And uh, as they were building, some were building, some were standing in guard, and some were being like watchmen to alert the people. And so each, you know, there were different teams, as you, if you want to call it that, and they were doing their work. So. You know, if you if you study Nehemiah, again you see a lot of organization in order to rebuild the walls, and it was a spiritual assignment God put in His heart. Right? Um, when you come into the New Testament, it's the same thing. Uh, let me pause and see see if there are any questions before I get into the New Testament. Everybody's following with me. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, all okay? All right. So now when we get into the New Testament, okay, 
Thank you for your responses in the chat. Uh, when you get to the New Testament, right from the church in Jerusalem. So the church in Jerusalem was birthed on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. At that time, there were the 12 apostles, and then there were other disciples, about 120 of them, and then many thousands came to faith. So the church was growing. And then, by the time you come to Acts chapter 6, there are some problems. Um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a problem, and the problem is actually very funny. It has to do with food distribution. Right? The Greek-speaking Jews were having problems with the Hebrew-speaking Jews. They were Jews, and they were the local Jews, Hebrew speaking, and they had problems with each other. One felt that, that they were not being given enough food, and the food was being distributed. They felt, hey, you're not treating us fairly. Now, you know, when you think about it, it seems like a very silly thing. You know, it, it has to do with food distribution. One group is feeling they're not getting the same amount of food as the other group. Anyway, but that was a problem. How did the apostles solve that problem? In Acts chapter 6, and, and all of us know this, right? They said, you find out seven men, seven or eight men, I forget, who are full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. And we will appoint these men to take care of the food distribution. So if you look at it from our context, they formed a team of people and they gave that team the responsibility to handle the food distribution. So food distribution was one part of the ministry of the church, but it was handled by a team. So there is organization there and uh, they were this this team was doing the local church. And by the time you come uh, you know late to the end of the episode, uh, uh, when you read in first uh, Timothy chapter three, uh, when Paul is writing to Timothy about the local church, he clearly demarcates two groups. He talks about elders, and then he talks about deacons. So elders, people responsible for the spiritual side of the ministry, which is the ministry of the word and prayer and taking care of the spiritual things of the people. And then deacons who would handle the, the administration, the running of the church. So think about this. Way back in the first century AD, as soon as the church had, was taking on expression, physical expression, there was organization. There were people who were responsible for the administration of the church. The Bible refers to them as deacons. And you know, in Romans chapter 16, now let's turn there. I think it's an interesting verse to read. If you turn to the Romans chapter 16, we read about this lady called Phoebe. Uh, can, can somebody read Romans 16, 1 and 2, please? Shall, shall I read, Pastor? Please go ahead. Romans 16, 1 and 2, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of Christ, of the church in Sancria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Mm. Now, think about this, right? Paul is giving a word of recommendation for somebody. This is a lady whose name is Phoebe. And what is her work in the church or for the church? 
she is handling uh, some sort of administration, organization, business of the church. And Paul is saying, you know, uh, when she comes, make sure you, you know, give her all the support she needs. I mean, just putting it in simple, you know, English. Uh, just give her all the support she needs to help her whatever way she wants help because she is carrying out, you know, the business of the church and she's, she's just being a blessing to many people. You know, so, uh, and that word is servant of the church. She's a deacon. She's a servant of the church. So you see very clearly um, that there were people in the church who were called to function uh, in the administration, in the organizational side of the church. So clearly, Paul talks about elders and deacons. He, and here in Romans 16 is a one particular person who is a deacon. And he's saying, give her all the support, you know, uh, because she's, she's helping many people. So in the first century AD itself, you can see organization in the church. You can see people a pastor, you or as a the leader of a spiritual ministry, you may be called to do the spiritual ministry, but you have to work together with people who are going to be doing the organization and administration of the church. Just like in this case, you know, Paul, he's an apostle. He's a pastor. I mean, he's a prophet. He's a teacher. He's an evangelist. Uh, at some points, he served, you know, pastoring the church he planted for a brief periods of time. So he's doing spiritual ministry. But he worked together with people who were deacons, who were doing the business of the church, the administration of the church, and we cannot escape that. You know, we will have to work. And in fact, for many of us, we will have to do some of that work as well. And especially uh, in the early stages of the ministry, uh, you will have to do it. You know, you may not have the, the people around you uh, to do the administration part, uh, uh, so you will have to do it yourself, you know. Uh, uh, I remember in the early days when we started our people's church, uh, I would do everything, you know. I would write the accounts. Uh, we had somebody who would come and put it into the system. Uh, I would, you know, send a thank you letter. I would respond to the emails. Uh, just, just about everything you had to do, you know. And later on, you know, as the work grows, then you will have people join in who will handle various aspects of the ministry. Uh, and even today, you know, uh, uh, one side I am involved in the spiritual side, but a lot of my time also goes in overseeing the organization of the church. Uh, uh, you know, surely at some point we'll get somebody who, who can handle the full organization of the church. But until such time, um, uh, you know, we, I'm involved in, in a lot of these in the organization side as well to make sure things run well. Okay, so we can't escape that. It is part of what what is uh, what has to happen. A couple of more scriptures from the New Testament side is let me read Romans chapter twelve. Let's go there. We right there in the book of Romans. We just turn to chapter twelve, please. And you look at verses 4 through 8, Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. Could somebody read that, please? Romans 12, 4 to 8. Anyone? For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion to our faith. For ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. 
he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. So uh, here Paul is telling us, look, the church is a body. People have different, uh, the church has many members and it's many people, but everyone has different functions. And then he says, let's all just serve according to the gift and the grace given to us. And then he begins to mention some of these gifts, uh, prophecy and uh, serving and teaching and encouraging and giving. And then he also mentions leadership and mercy or compassion as functions. Right? So leadership, if I just want to highlight one of them, leadership is one of those functions. That means you're going to be leading people. So in the church, God has put people with this function or with this ability, with this grace to lead people. Right? So the moment you talk about leadership, then you think about teams or groups of people who are being led to do something for a purpose. Leadership, lead people in order to accomplish something. So, you know, depending on the team, that team is led by somebody in order to fulfill a certain function. Okay, let's look at one more verse before we go for the break. Let's go to First Corinthians twelve twenty-eight. First Corinthians twelve and verse twenty-eight. Somebody could read that for us, for us please. Sir, go ahead. First Corinthians twelve twenty eight, and yes, God please. has appointed these in the church: first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, we are all familiar with apostles and prophets and teachers, miracles, and gifts of healings. But notice the next two. There is helps and administration. Helps and administration. So in the church, God has put this helps administration. So nobody can say, now, so help is basically somebody who helps in anything. Now, you, have, you can have helpers uh, helping the church, just getting something done. You know, if they're doing the media, that's helping. If they're doing the sound, that's helping. If they are, you know, handling communications, replying to the emails, that's helping. Uh, if they are, uh, you know, answering the phone, that's helping. Whatever. You know, you could have highly skilled helpers or general helpers or whatever. So he said there are help and administration. So notice, it is God has appointed this in the church. In the church, God has called the people to be helpers and administrators. Now, today, if somebody says, oh, the church should not have administration, excuse me, <laughs> right here in verse 28, it says God has put people to be helpers and administrators. So you can't take administration out of the church. You can't take, the moment you have administration, obviously, it means there is organization. It means there's a structure. It means there are systems and processes. It means there's leadership, there's teams, there is activity, all these things. The moment there are helps and administrations, all these come in, right? So nobody can say administration is not of God or organization is not of God because right here, God has appointed people to be helpers and administrators in the church. Okay? So I hope you are following me so far. Is it okay? You with me? Any questions before we go for a break? Shrikumar, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry, I just want to know from the uh, from the first Corinthians twelve twenty eight um, mm -hmm. that um, you know here he mentions that God has said some of the church first apostles, second prophet, and third teachers. So uh, 
these are actually the offices or the um, uh, of uh, what do you call five about the fivefold ministry systems. So now I just want to know that uh, why he mentioned um, the gift of healing and the diversity of things uh, connected with this. I can understand mm -hmm. government can be also be a part of uh, um, you know, um, but also he mentioned miracles, gift of healing. And I mm. don't of things. So I just mm. want to know that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Very, very good question. Very, uh, I think a very perceptive question. Um, the answer is the context. What is he talking about? In First Corinthians 12, the context is the functioning of the body. So his focus in writing at this point while he's writing. First Corinthians 12 is talking about the body. And he's saying there are different members and they're doing different functions. So he is not demarcating offices and gifts, but he's bringing them together like a mashup of this is how the body works. So that's why verse 28, First Corinthians 12, 28, is not a demarcation of here are the five offices, here are the nine gifts, and here are the believer's gifts. It's not a demarcation of that, but it's a mashup, meaning in the body, you're going to have people doing all kinds of things. So verse 28 is a mashup of various functions and activities and operations, like he mentions, First Corinthians 12, uh, 6, 7, 8. He says there are diversities of operations, there are diversities of ministries and there are diversities of gifts. So verse 28 is like, okay, no, here are just here's an assortment of you know um, functions or, or offices and gifts and uh, activities of functions taking place. So he mentions certain things which we would call as offices: apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, gifts of healing. Then he mentions what we would refer to as gifts of the spirit: gifts of healings, workings of miracles diverse cities of tongues. And then he mentions certain things that we would call as believers gift, health administration. It's a mashup of these things, meaning to say that in the body, hey, all of these things are operating. Thank you. Pastor. Yeah, good, good question. All right, so what we'll do is we'll uh, go for a quick break. Welcome back. And uh, I will try to make the course exciting. Okay, I don't know. Everybody's really quiet. Uh, I hope you uh, uh, enjoy uh, uh, ministry uh, administration and uh, organization. Uh, it is exciting, uh, but it's also very, very challenging. Uh, uh, people, okay, let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and continue. Thank you.